Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're really excited to introduce you to this new project we've been working on. These are the uh, winemakers tasting flights. And this is a new thing for us, but it's been in the works for a long time. And the idea behind it is that we want to give you uh, a sense of the wines that we're most excited about, we meaning the seller team, um, season to season, and give you a little bit more information on them and um, some suggested food pairings and some reasoning why they work uh, in the particular season while we're highlighting them. Um, this is Alex. Alex is our assistant winemaker. I'm Phil, I'm the head winemaker, and we are gonna talk you through these, um, uh, the wines that we have pulled for today and, and hopefully going forward quarterly. So season to season, we're gonna have new things on the flight and we're excited to share them all with you. So Alex, this uh, first flight that we're gonna do, we picked wines that, that we feel are, are really well suited to cooler winter months. Mm. Um, when I think of wintertime wines, I like to find things that have um, big textures, maybe sure. some savory edges, and, and some spice if we can help it. Any Anything that you look for in a wintertime wine? Uh, usually a little bit heavier palate weight is what I gravitate toward, especially. Uh, something that actually leans off of acidity. Yeah. Looking for more roundness, like we're saying. Yeah, savory. refreshing is great, but in, in yeah. warmer, warmer times, um, you can't feel how cold it is in the cellar right now, but we're yeah. We're not thinking of summer at the moment. It's awful. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like we're really looking at things that maybe go well with wintertime foods, like yeah. more savory, stick to your ribs, heartier stuff. So yeah, yeah. I think with the palate weight, you're going to end up with wines that, that are really expressive and stand up against those classic wintertime dishes. Sure, sure. Yeah, I know when we start to move into these months, uh, food becomes much more hearty. Um, much more intense and I think you know light delicate wines are not going to do the thing uh, yeah. that you're looking for this and time there's of year. a lot of ways to get that weight into a wine and we'll talk about that as we go through so awesome. yeah. why don't we get started that sounds great so Alex when we think of uh, wines for the winter time it's important to to recognize that we've got a lot of celebrate celebrations through the winter we got mm -hmm. Christmas New Year Valentine's Day sure. so we felt like sparkling would be an appropriate thing to feature here um, this one is kind of a, a throwback. So this is our sparkling Catawba Cuvée. Um, it's made in the champagne method and it's brute finished, which means that it's, it's really dry. It's about seven, eight grams per liter residual sugar. So enough to take the edge off of the acid, but not enough to, to read as sweet. Certainly not. Um, and this is a wine that, that's really reflective of, of the wines that enabled everything around here in the Finger Lakes. So. Catawba sparkling done in this style mm -hmm. were the first commercial wines made in, in America. Wow. Um, back in the, the early 1800s by uh, a guy named Nicholas Longworth. He was out of Cincinnati, Ohio, and he proved that it could be done. And, and people here in the Finger Lakes and, and throughout the East Coast followed him up and started planting these, these old hybrid grapes and, and making traditional method sparkling from them. And these are wines that, that were available internationally too. He was exporting back to Europe and Wow. and they were receiving praise there. So, yeah. so we owe a lot of what we do to these Champagne Method Catawbas Certainly. that came before us. Yeah. Um, this one is a 2021, which means uh, that wasn't one that you were here for, but, <laughs> nope. but you were making wine on the East Coast at that time, and, and it wasn't fun sure. for any of us. No, um, tough vintage, it was. Yeah, so, so everything kind of was, was wet and, and dilute, and one of the things that we needed to do to make the wines that we were supposed to make that year <laughs> is make adjustments. And um, we make a, a fortified skin fermented Catawba dessert wine mm -hmm. and that just wasn't picking up the concentration we wanted. Mm -hmm. So we opted to move to a Sanye, yep. which is where we pull some of the, the juice out of the bins early just to leave everything with some more skin contact. Mm -hmm. This is where the Sanye went. So it was crushed, held overnight, and, and then pulled aside and, and we made this sparkling base from it. And when we went to, to dosage it at the end, mm -hmm. add some sweetness, we use that fortified dessert wine as our dosage. So everything came back together at the end. Yeah, that's an interesting way to bring it all back together, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Now, Phil, maybe you can talk about um, what I noticed about this wine, first thing, uh, luxury and creaminess. It just has that rich, opulent texture. Yeah. Um, the mousse on it is phenomenal. Very delicate, light bubbles. 
Uh, how do we go about in achieving that? So in bottle fermentation, like you do in the champagne method, is really critical for making that happen. Mm. Um, so when we're bottling these, they still have yeast in them, mm -hmm. and the yeast is going to wake up in the bottle and eat the sugar that we've left behind for it, and that's where we're going to get our bubble from. Mm -hmm. But the longer that we leave it in contact with the yeast, mm -hmm. the, the more that we pick up influences from them. So sure. uh, we get pallet weight as they break down, we get aromatics as they break down, mm -hmm. and part of the challenge with this wine is we've got to figure out how to get the weight without getting the aromatics that are going to obscure those natural floral and grapey aromas yeah. that we all love. Trying to Kitala. avoid bread and yeast. Yeah, so this bit. one this one spends about 18 months on the spent yeast, okay. um, just enough to grab the weight and, and yeah. not enough to stifle the aromatics. Yeah, no, wonderful. It, it, it has that incredible still, um, even though we're talking about drinking it in the winter, this yeah. can still be brought out during summer, especially as we move into spring. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's not, you know, it's refreshing without disappearing. No, right, um, right, right. And it lingers for a while and makes you feel like it's more substantial, which I think is why it works in this season. Right. Um, I think to pair this wine, yep. classic sparkling, you want fried foods. Yeah. And I yeah, think yeah. this is, fried shrimp would be perfect with this. No, this- Like tempura. Anything Thai yeah. or like in an Asian direction, I think would be would be wonderful with this. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think you can go salty, you can go- Yeah. Yeah. Just that crispy, greasy, all that good stuff. You've got enough acid here to clean it up. Yep. yep. Um, Even something buttery and rich like salmon yeah. would complement this well. Sure. Like sure. Uh, soft cheeses. Yeah. Certainly. Um, yeah. Not in season right now, but strawberries. No. Yeah. When they come would be around. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So this next wine we have is uh, wintertime white wine, which people don't often associate white wines with winter. No. Uh, this is our 2020 Reserve Edelsvicker. Edelsvicker is a word that we stole from our friends in Alsace. Alsace being on the border of France and Germany, they use a lot of uh, German terms there. Um, Edelsvicker is a compound word. It means noble blend. So it's a blend of any of the noble grapes that you find in Alsace. In this case, we're almost a straight third, 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 Pinot Gris, Gewürztraminer, and Riesling. And this is a 2020 vintage, which we talked about 2021 earlier. Yeah. 2020 was the exact opposite. It was just perfection, absent yep. all of the death and destruction happening <laughs> in the world. Um, so in 2020, um, we were allowed to push our white wines in a, a way heavier direction than, mm -hmm. than we typically do. Um, a lot of times with these grape varieties that I mentioned, we're doing some heavy press fractioning because Sometimes the tannins aren't fully ripe and, sure. and, and they can be really obscuring to the aromatics we're trying to, to get out of these wines. Mm -hmm. But in 2020, everything got so ripe mm -hmm. that it felt like a shame to try and clean it up. So yeah. what we did was we opted to take all of this hard pressed juice and barrel ferment it and let it hang out and soften mm -hmm. itself and, and really just kind of let it work its own way out. Right. Um, and, and that's the wines that, that went into this. So everything was fermented separately. Um, we blended them back together before we were ready to bottle them. So they sat in the barrels uh, for several months on lees. Mm -hmm. I think we were probably out to about six, six, seven months by the time it was time to pull these oh, wow. um, with some regular batonnage. So we were stirring yeah. the lees, trying to get that, that yeast influence yeah. into the bottle, adding weight and, and, and some savory edges. Um, yeah, so let's taste it. Yeah. Uh, with these, Phil, I will say the oak component is there, but it's it's more textural driven than it is necessarily on the nose. You know, I, I'm not getting like an immense amount of uh, like vanilla or those generic oaky flavors that you can sometimes pick up. It's yeah. definitely more tannin in the mouth and then still a lot of floral. Uh, the acid is still very present. Yeah. Um, what, what are you looking for when you're... So that's a commonality across our winemaking. Yeah. Um, we like the way that oak feels, mm -hmm. but we would rather you didn't smell it first. <laughs> um, wine's made from grapes, and, and, and we want those to show first. Sure. And, and especially with varieties like this that are typically a little more delicate yeah. as far as their aromatic profiles, Gewürztraminer aside, yep. um, we don't want to get in the way of anything, anything there. Right. Um, so it's a good way to add some texture mm -hmm. um, if you can get old barrels yeah. without adding all of the aromatic things that say wood. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Did, did this it, go through full ML too? Uh, this didn't go through any ML. Wow. Yeah, yeah this incredible. is all leaves and glycerol yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. all kinds of good stuff. Yep. Um, this one actually comes with a food pairing too. So we're going to pair this with the Miranda Dilly Girl Cheddar. Um, and I think that's going to work really well because this has such a dill aromatic bent to it. Like yeah, the birch yeah. terminer is so flowery and it's got that like sweet herbal thing going on. Yeah. So yeah. I think they're going to pair off really well. It's got enough acid to stand up with the fat of the cheese, yep. um, but it's also got enough enough strength that it's not mm. going to get buried by it. No, no, certainly. This is wonderful. But I love this wine with, with anything with pork, like just mm -hmm. roast pork, pork chops, things like that. It's got enough weight, like we said. Pork tenderloin. Oh, my God. A little bit of applesauce yeah, uh, would be wonderful absolutely. with this. Yeah. Like classic German interpretations too, with like mm. braised cabbage, things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You could go Warm in sour prep direction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And again, still interesting. A wine that as we're coming into spring will still be enjoyable. You, you know, mm -hmm. this, this doesn't have to be only a wintertime sipper. Um, mm -hmm. This holds up very nicely with the acid still being very present in it. Yeah, I think. I think the speed of the way that we enjoy a wine changes season to season. Yeah. Like I think these these wintertime wines are for mm -hmm. for slow observation and contemplation, whereas the summertime Certainly. wines, like you just want them to be zippy <laughs> and refreshing and, yeah. and and go from there. Yeah, yeah. Um so so these are wines that we use to slow things down a little bit. Beautiful. So now we're into the category of wines that I think are most associated with wintertime, and that's mm. dry reds. Certainly. Um, and dry reds work for a lot of different reasons. They go with so many of those hearty foods that we were talking about earlier. Um, sometimes they can have a little spiciness that warms you up. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately the fact that we're serving them at a higher temperature than we mm. typically serve white and sparkling is, is something that's a benefit this time of year. Certainly. Um, this one that we have is our Murdered Out Count 2. That's part of our Velour series here. Those are really our art wines. Um, we've talked a lot previously in, in a lot of other formats and, and platforms about what makes those wines special, so we'll save that for, for those. Mm -hmm. um, but this one's a blend of Lemberger, Cab Sauv, uh, Saparavi, and Cab Franc. And it's across vintages. There's some 2020 and some 2021. So you've got a little bit of both, both the, yeah. the best of the best and the worst of the worst as far as weather <laughs> conditions. Um, so yeah, this one I think is a story uh, as most blending is mm -hmm. in, in wine where you have some stuff that doesn't really have enough to be on its own and, right. and it needs something else. And, and what you find is that it needs the other barrels in the program that don't have homes. Sure. And that's, what, what this was. You were here when we were blending this last one. I, I remember, yeah, 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 yeah. No, this was, uh, this was a fun one to put together. Um, and a little bit different, too, uh, than Valer 1. Um, just yeah. variety-wise, uh, as well as f flavor profile. Sure. But anyone who liked, I think, Count 1, will, I think they'll still gravitate toward Count 2 as well. Yeah, and, and just to, to make it clear, we, we never intend to tread on the same territory twice with the Valor mm -hmm. wine. So even sure. though it's got this murdered out name, it's never going to be the same blend. It's always right. going to be different, different ideas going into that bottle. So right, right. yeah, let's give it a taste. Cool. So this one's coming with another food pairing. Um, this one we're going to pair with some Yancey's Fancy Uncured Pepperoni, and I think mm -hmm. it's going to be perfect. There's a lot of brightness here, and that's going to be good to cut through the fat uh, of something like a cured meat, right? but it's got some smokiness and spiciness too. I think that Saparavi carries a lot of the acidity in mm -hmm. this blend especially. It cuts out a lot of the um, maybe not as well developed tannins yet um, sure. and creates a nice balance with this one. Well, and Saparavi also has that meaty, gamey characteristic that I think pairs really well with things like charcuterie because it's got that cured, fermented mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of vibe to it. Mm. And these are great varieties that you don't always see together in other parts of the world. So that's one of the fun things about being here in the Finger Lakes is that we get to 
Yeah. We get to put things together that, that didn't grow up together. I was going to say, there's no analog for this. Any Like, this blend was kind of... You can only make this in a finger <laughs> yeah. list, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Very true. So I think outside of the pairing that we're going to provide for this, this is classic winter food. This is chili. Mm -hmm. This is pot roast. Um, like maybe red sauces if you get into like doing Sunday sauce and things like that. I was gonna say sausages and pork and everything else. Yeah, this is gonna be perfect with that. Yeah, cutting through a lot of like heavy pastas, sure. raviolis, even this time of year. I know I make a lot of those. Uh, this is actually what I think I would gravitate toward. Yeah I, yeah, I think that's one of the again one of the nice things about being in the Finger Lakes is yeah. that like even when we make a big red wine, it's still super food friendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doesn't get flabby at all, sure. doesn't fall off. And even oak on this too is very texturally driven. It, uh, not a lot on the nose. There's no like vanilla sticking out like a yeah. sore thumb or anything like that. Yeah, we try and keep it restrained. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so this last one we have is another straight up 2020. And, mm. and I'm really excited about this. This has only been available for sale for a couple months now. This is our Montezuma Reserve 2020 Cab Franc. Mm. Um, and we talked about uh, the 2020 vintage and how special that was and it was like the best conditions for dry red sure. so so we're really excited about all of the reds that came out of that season mm -hmm. um cab franc is is probably the signature vinifera red variety of the finger Lakes. so sure. it's always exciting to to work with cab franc <laughs> it's even more exciting to work with cab franc in a year like 2020. Um, this fruit was all sourced from Sawmill Creek Vineyard, which is in the banana belt of the Finger Lakes in, in Hector, New York, on the east side of Seneca Lake. Really cool microclimate there that allows red wines, red grapes to ripen differently than they do just 10 miles up the road. So it's, it's always special to get fruit from that vineyard, but mm. to get it in a vintage like 2020 is like, you can't ask for anything Even more. Even more exciting. Yeah. 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 Um, so this one has been in the bottle for about two years now, so it's been calming down. Mm -hmm. um, wine sometimes goes through this period called bottle shock where, where after you bottle them, they're a little shook up and they don't, don't show as well as they should. Mm. Um, so we've held on to this and, and it's drinking beautifully right now. No, this is wonderful, yeah. I think my favorite thing about this wine is how much it changes. And I would encourage uh, people, if you like this wine and buy it, buy some to lay down. Or at the very least, try and restrain yourself and, <laughs> and drink it over the course of a week. Because it say, changes yeah. so much on your countertop. I think when yep. I first open a bottle of this, it's so earthy. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of that forest floor mushroom thing. Yep. Um, perfect for this time of year. I was going to say, yeah. But, but it shifts over time so after a few days open we get more into this big ripe fruit yep. and it shows you something different every day so mm. uh, i think this one's going to be good for a really long time yeah yeah no i, I noticed this too phil uh, a little bit more restrained acid on this than say the count too um i think a lot more lush tannins this really is this really is amazing um what do you find with cabernet franc vintage to vintage year to year um do we go more like a fruit forward direction or more austere mineral? How do you place Cabernet Franc? In so it depends. I think um, I think if you had asked that question mm. 15 years ago, the answers <laughs> would be different. Yeah, right? sure. Uh, for a long time, part of the challenge about Cabernet Franc in the Finger Lakes was that it tasted under ripe in, in a weak vintage. Mm. And, and I think to their credit, the vineyard managers around here have figured that out. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that we're chasing away that green bell pepper thing that you would find in, in previous tough vintages in the Finger Lakes, sure. but that uh, 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 a weaker vintage, mm -hmm. I think it is one that we would push more in that austere mineral mm -hmm. and maybe leave it totally stainless. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in a year like 2020, you've got big ripe tannins mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you want to capture all of them and just let them soften on their own terms. So this, everything in here w was in relatively neutral barrels. Okay. We, we don't have a, a red wine barrel uh, around here that's less than a few years old. I was going to say, so, there's nothing new. Um, yeah. We really prioritize that in our program because we're getting all the good textures and all the good softening, but without the, the aromatic imprints that, that yeah. say oak. Right, right, right. 
move here. Yeah, this one is just so developed, and, and I'm really excited to see where it goes mm. in years to come. But, mm -hmm. but I think we probably saved the best for last here. No, I know. This one was my favorite as well. Food pairings, do we have any strong feelings about? Uh... I think this is braised short ribs. Yeah. I think this is mushroom risotto. Yeah, I was going to um, say more of a steak direction. Prime rib. Yep. Perfect. Just yeah. like really meaty, um, really rich. I, yep. I think it's got the richness to stand up to that kind of stuff. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Hey, everyone. We just want to thank you for watching these videos and uh, taking the time to really get to know some of these wines with us. Uh, Phil and I are excited to do this again with you. We are going to be doing it every quarter, monthly, something. Something quarterly. Like that. quarterly. Yeah. There'll be more videos. We're going to share a lot more information, do a lot more exciting things, dive into the world of wine yeah. uh, as it relates to us in the Finger Lakes. Um, anything, anything else? If it hasn't come across, Alex and I are obsessed with wine. Um, and we don't always get to share that with our customers because we got a lot going on back here in the cellar. So this has been really fun to be able to get some of these in front of you and explain why we think they're so special. And uh, we'll look forward to doing it more season to season.